I am presenting Union Gospel Presses Sunday School Lesson Number 7, Sunday, October 17th, 2021. The lesson is entitled, Miriam and Aaron Oppose Moses. Lesson text comes from Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 16. Related scriptures are Numbers 5, 1 through 4. 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 21. Deuteronomy 35, 34, 5 through 12. Exodus 33, 12 through 23. Hebrews 3, 1 through 6. The place is the desert of Paran. The time is 1444 BC. In previous lessons, we have looked at some very unflattering episodes in Israel's history. The death of Aaron's sons, the stoning of a blasphemer of God, and the peoples despising the Lord's gracious provision of manna and insisting that he give them meat to eat. It is truly amazing how the Bible records such unflattering moments in the history of the people of God. One might think that any religious sacred text would bolster its adherence, self-confidence, but, no, not, but not this book, not the Bible. The Bible shows an unfiltered divine perspective, a perspective that glorifies God, not human beings. This week, our text focuses not on the people of Israel as a whole or even on Moses himself, but rather on two individuals, Aaron and Miriam, Numbers 12, 1 through 16. On the one hand, this narrative is a tale of pettiness and self-ambition. On the other hand, it is another portrayal of the Lord's faithfulness and gracious character. Today's aim, facts. To learn to see God's faithfulness in the face of pettiness and betrayal of even close friends and family. Principle, to affirm that each of our roles in God's plan is determined by God alone. Application, to acquire the focus and determination to not be distracted from seeing God's faithfulness by the ungodly acts of those around us. Illustrating the lesson. <coughs> To oppose those who are faithfully serving God is to bring on ourselves divine rebuke and judgment. Practical point. One, when we feel the need to rebuke someone, we should consider whether our feelings are sinful or justified according to God's word. Numbers 12, 1. Two, we should always be meek in considering our roles in the family of God not asserting authority where we have none, verses 2 through 3. 3. God's justice is sure, so we can have peace when we are falsely assured or defamed, verses 4 through 5. 4. In Christ, we can have intimacy with God and should seek a close relationship with Him, verses 6 through 8. 5. Do not provoke the Lord. He will chastise His children, verses 9 through 10. 6. Even after we repent, Sin still often has consequences, verses 11 through 16. Golden text. If there be a prophet among you, if I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream, Numbers 12, 6. Today we have two lesson outlines. The first is Aaron and Miriam speak against Moses, Numbers 12, 1 through 9. The second is Moses intercedes for Miriam, Numbers 12, 10 through 16. Introduction. One of the greatest enemies facing the church is jealousy. Even we, the children of God, can be guilty of allowing the success or promotion of others to blind us to what God actually wants from us. If God has not given us the job or position we want, it is because he has something else for us at this time. Anything we do that is different from what God has for us should be considered a regrettable step down. It is especially dangerous when jealousy causes us to speak against someone whom God has anointed for special service. As we see in this week's lesson, God showed that he would not tolerate anyone coming against the leader he had anointed to nurture and care for Israel as they journeyed to the promised land. Aaron and Moses, Aaron and Miriam speak against Moses. Numbers 12, 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman he had married. 
he had married an Ethiopian woman, verse 2. And they said, Have the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Have he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it, verse 3. Now the man, Moses, was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth, verse 4. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out, verse 5. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. Verse 6, And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. Verse 7, My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. Verse 8, With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall be behold. Wherefore, then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Verse 9. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Ethnic Issues. Numbers 12, 1. As the Israelites traveled through the wilderness toward the promised land, Moses endured several challenges to his authority. There were many in the Israelite camp who at various times rebelled against his leadership. Perhaps the most significant challenge, however, came from his own brother and sister. At some point after the plague involving the quail, 1131 through 35, Miriam and Aaron began to resent Moses. Initially, the reason stated for this resentment had to do with the Ethiopian ethnicity of Moses' wife. Ethiopia, also referred to as the land of Cush, was located to the south of Egypt. Some 40 miles, some 40 years before this time, Moses had married Zipporah, who is identified as a Midianite, Exodus 2, 16 through 22. Some have argued that Midian and Cush were two names for the same place, and Zipporah is, is one reference to in Numbers 12, 1. Most scholars suggest it is most likely that Zipporah had died and Moses had married an Ethiopian woman. The fact that Miriam and Aaron opposed Moses is significant for several reasons. First, they were his sister and brother. Second, and more important, their opposition meant that both the prophetic and priestly offices were now seeking to undermine Moses' divinely held position of authority. Miriam is mentioned as a prophetess among the women, Exodus 15:20, while Aaron was appointed by God to be the high priest of Israel, 28:1 prophet and priest thus allied themselves against God's anointed, appointed mediator over Israel. Miriam's prominence and the judgment she subsequently suffered indicated that she was the instigator who influenced her brother Aaron to join, to join her in bringing their grievance. With the problems caused by the complaining of the mixed multitude, Numbers 11, 4, which led to the quail and the plague and the blaspheming of God's name, by the son of an Egyptian man, Leviticus 24, 10 through 11, perhaps Miriam and Aaron were suggesting that Moses was hypocritical for having a wife of non-Israel descent. Whatever particular objection they voiced concerning Moses' wife, it was, as we will see, nothing but a smokescreen for the real reason for resenting their brother. Miriam and Aaron's Jealousy, Numbers 12, 2 through 3. Although Miriam and Aaron grumbled against Moses' Ethiopian wife, they revealed the jealousy within their own hearts by asking their real question. Did God speak only through Moses? The implication here is that God also spoke through them, prophetess and priests just the same. Why then did Moses reserve such great authority for himself? They resented the closeness of the relationship Moses had with God and the authority God <clears throat> had given him as Israel's foremost leader. They certainly did not like the fact that God spoke and ruled primarily through their younger brother. In their minds, Moses did not qualify for such a leadership role any more than they did. Perhaps they wished to imply that Moses was an authoritarian who had allowed his ego to get out of control and run wild, much to the detriment of the people. 
The only thing out of control in this situation was the jealousy that fueled Miriam and Aaron's complaint. In a parenthetical note, verse 3 states that Moses was the meekest man on earth. Meekness in this instance is closely associated with the humility, meaning that Moses was the exact opposite of how his sister and brother portrayed him. They saw him as an egomaniac, while the, while the commentary within the text says nothing could have been further from the truth. God calls Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. Numbers 12, 4 through 5. God wasted no time in getting involved in this dispute. Very suddenly, he called Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to meet him at the tabernacle or tent of meeting where his presence was manifested. God was not going to tolerate any more of the backbiting against Moses by his sister and brother who were now going to be called to account for their envy and rebellion. Previously, we learned about a man who was punished for cursing the name of God, and now we see the seriousness of speaking against God's chosen servant. While not as serious as speaking directly against God himself, it is still a dangerous thing to speak against those whom God has divinely chosen for a specific work. It is like saying that God did not know what he was doing when he chose that person. God uses individuals and church committees to help God's servants find the place in ministry where they can best serve the Lord with their unique gifts. However, Ultimately, it is the Lord who chooses people for service according to his will. Admittedly, we may not always understand his reasoning, but we must always be content to submit to his will. We must be content to serve in the capacity for which he has called and equipped us and to work humbly alongside our fellow servants. After Moses, Miriam, and Aaron gathered at the tabernacle, God descended in a pillar of a cloud and stood at the entrance. There he called Miriam and Aaron to come and appear before him. This moment reminds me of the many times my brother and I would get into a fight as boys, only to hear the thunderous voice of my dad calling our names. Those situations did not typically work out in a pleasurable way for me, and it was most likely things would go so well for Aaron and for Miriam and Aaron either. The faithfulness of Moses, Numbers 12, 6 through 7. There was no mistakes, no mistaking who was speaking to Miriam and Aaron as God told them to hear his words. The pillar of cloud gave visible manifestation to the presence of the God of the Lord. Normally, when God spoke, he did so through Moses. In this instance, however, he addressed the rebellious prophetess and priest directly. He did not provide Moses with words of defense to recite to his brother, to his sister and brother. They likely would have been suspicious of that type of message. So God spoke to them directly and audibly in a way that left no doubt that he was the speaker and not Moses. In fact, Moses remained silent through all this. God did not deny that he spoke with and through prophets, but he typically did so by visions and dreams. Moses, on the other hand, was unique. The condemnation that Moses was faithful in all mine house, verse 7, does not mean he was perfect. In fact, as we previously learned in Numbers 11, he at times voiced his own displeasure with God. However, Moses was faithful in what God called him to do. Though he stumbled and sinned occasionally, the consistent pattern of his life was to obey the Lord. It is significant that God identified Moses as his servant. This points to a special relationship between God and Moses that is detailed more fully in the following verses. Moses was a prophet to be sure, Deuteronomy 18.15, but he was more than that. He was also Israel's intercessor with the Lord and the mediator of the covenant between Israel and God. God's unique relationship with Moses, Numbers 12, 8 through 9. When God spoke to Moses, he did not do so through visions and dreams. Instead, he spoke to him directly. He did not use riddles or figurative speech, but conversed clearly with him. God and Moses spoke to one another in a way that showed very close communion and relationship. God then asked Miriam and Aaron very pointedly why, knowing he spoke directly to Moses. They were not afraid to speak against him. 
What made them think they could speak against one so close to God without any repercussions? The anger of the Lord burned against Miriam and Aaron. Moses intercedes for Miriam. Verse 10. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam was leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Verse 11. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Verse 12. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's womb. Verse 13. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that let her be received in again. Verse 15. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. Verse 16. And afterward, the people removed from Hezeroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Miriam contra contracts leprosy. Numbers 10, 12, 10. The setting just described above is that of a courtroom where the plaintiff's defendant and judge are assembled. The judge had already heard the plaintiff's case against the defendant and called all parties together. Interestingly enough, the, de the defendant never had to say a word as the judge actually doubled as his attorney and spoke for him. The case against Moses, against Moses, spurious as it was to begin with, was dismissed entirely when the judge left the courtroom. But his ruling against the plaintiffs became clear as Miriam instantly became leprous. This would surely have stunned both Moses and Aaron as they saw their sister turn completely white with this infectious skin disease. Aaron pleads with Moses for Miriam, Numbers 12. 11 through 12. Aaron immediately turned to Moses and asked him to punish, not to punish Miriam and him for their foolishness. He admitted that he had, that they had sinned and pleaded for mercy. Moses, of course, had nothing to do with Miriam's punishment. It was inflicted by God. However, this divine judgment effectively reinforced to Aaron and Moses who God's chosen servant and he received the message loud and clear. That he understood this is seen by the fact that he addressed Moses as his Lord. The horror Aaron felt as he saw his sister afflicted with such a terrible disease was expressed quite vividly as he compared her to a stillborn child who comes out of his mother's womb with his flesh half eaten. Aaron realized that they both had sinned, but he did not want Miriam to die. The only thing he knew to do was to plead with Moses to intercede for her life. Moses' prayer and God's answer. Numbers 12, 13 through 14. After Aaron turned to Moses in desperation and repentance, Moses immediately went to God with the same sense of desperation as Aaron. Moses' prayer for Miriam shows that he did not allow feelings of anger or bitterness toward her to dominate his thoughts or attitude. In fact, there is no indication from the text at all that Moses ever harbored any resentment toward Miriam or Aaron. God was the one who had called Miriam and Aaron to account and defended Moses. Moses, on the other hand, never offered one word of self-defense or rebuttal. God responded to Moses' intercessory prayer for Miriam by stating that he would, he would forgive and restore her, but her sin would not be without consequences. She would be healed and restored, but she would undergo a brief period of punishment. The Lord explained that if Miriam's father had spit in her face, she would be required to leave the camp for seven days. This was not based on a specific statue from the Mosaic law, but to be spat upon was to suffer contempt, Deuteronomy 25, 9, and to be made ceremonially unclean, Leviticus 15, 8. Miriam's offense called for more shame than that, yet God was willing to treat her graciously. She could have been sentenced to permanent banishment, but he limited her exile from the camp to just seven days. Shutting her out of the camp for seven days was consistent with the laws required 
purification process of restoring to the community at large those who naturally contracted such a disease. Leviticus 14, 1 through 9. At the conclusion of a seven-day period of isolation, Miriam would be readmitted to the camp. Restoration of Miriam, Numbers 12, 15 through 16. The passage concludes by acknowledging that Miriam did indeed remain outside the camp for the next seven days. At the end of this time of waiting, she was received back among her people fully restored, yet with an indelible reminder of the power of God and the evil of jealousy. During those seven days, while Miriam remained outside, the people did not move on. They remained until she could rejoin them. Once Miriam returned, the people resumed their journey from Hezeroth through the wilderness of Paran. Questions 1. What reason does the text give initially for Miriam and Aaron's resentment of Moses? 2. What was the real reason behind their resentment? 3. What did God do immediately in response to Miriam and Aaron's words against Moses? Four, how did the Lord show his presence to Aaron, Miriam, and Moses? Five, how did God say he typically spoke to prophets? Six, how did God say he spoke with Moses? Seven, in what way did God punish Miriam? Eight, how did Aaron respond when he saw Miriam with leprosy? Nine, how did God answer Moses' prayer on behalf of Miriam? 10. How was God gracious to Miriam even in her judgment? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, October 17, 2021. Thank you for listening. God bless.